Hey, this is for a viewer. He asked a couple times. I've been really behind on requests, on emails and everything. Uh, we have the funeral tomorrow. Uh, please, guys, don't get so frustrated with me because you're ignoring my request. You're, you said you'd debate me on the gospel. Well, let me let me bury my son's dad. Okay, just give me some time here. I need. It's only. It's been less than a week. I need to strengthen myself before <laughs> I deal with other people's stuff right now. Can you just? Can you give me a little grace here? Okay? I'm not, don't take it personal. All right? I'm not ignoring you. All right. Um, so, all right, let me just tell you guys, do not be afraid of the word repent. Okay? You can repent of a sin. You can repent of eating a salad and have a sandwich. You can repent of, uh, God repents many times, and it's usually he repents of the judgment. That he's going to bring on the nation of Israel. Or he repented of the evil he would do unto Nineveh. So you can repent of anything. Now there's two. I, I hate going. I'm going to the Greek. No, the, the reason. The only reason I went back to the original Greek word. Is because the word repent has been redefined. In our in our, in our uh, di current dictionaries. It was common to know that repent mean a change of mind. Now, the connotation has been changed. Just like the word gay, the connotation has been changed. It used to mean happy. Now it means to be homosexual. So, words change context and connotation, okay, over time. But we need to look at what the context was for the word at the time based on surrounding scriptures, okay? So, that's what we do, okay? There's nothing, nothing should scare you about the word repent. The problem is people have redefined it. Modern uh, dictionaries say to feel sorry or regretful for sin or wrongdoing. Well, there's two words in the Greek. Now, this is the only reason I went back to the Greek to see which word was used for the word repent in English. Because there are three words in Greek that can be translated to repent. Okay, one is metanoia or metaneo. That means a change of mind. That's the word used in these verses. The other one is metamalami, and that means to feel regret or sorry for wrongdoing. Okay? That's not the word used. No. God's not telling them, feel sorry for your sin and believe the gospel. No. He's saying, change your mind about who Jesus is and now believe on him. Okay? That's what it is in context. John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to believe on he who came after them. Now, if it was about uh, more law-keeping, not sinning, why did he tell the Pharisees to bring forth fruits meet for repentance? They already kept the law outwardly as best as any human could. Was he telling them to keep the law stricter? No, no. He was telling them, prove to me that you've changed your mind about Jesus being the Messiah. Because he said, believe on the one who comes after me. That is Christ Jesus. Okay? So, uh, and he's saying, prove to me. Bring forth fruits, meet for that repentance. Bring forth, approve to me. Come and get baptized is basically what he's telling them. All right? So, um, I'm going to give you the verse here that he is concerned about. It is 2 Peter 3, 9. Uh, let me get over here to that. 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Okay, now let's look what's being said before that. He says, this second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, okay, that you be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us apostles of the Lord, uh, Lord and Savior. Now, uh, remember, Peter was sent to the circumcision and Paul was sent to the uncircumcision. So Peter, all his epistles are written to Jewish Israelite Hebrew believers, okay? Or they're written to Hebrew Jews and Israelites that some believed and some didn't, okay? So we have to read in context. So here he's saying, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust and saying, where is the promise of his coming? 
For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. He's saying, well, he, this Messiah keeps claiming he's going to come back, but he hasn't come back. Where is it? You know, that's what he's saying. He's trying to say uh, to the fellow Hebrews and Jews here that you remember that the prophet spoke of this. It's going to happen, you know, and that Jesus fulfilled all those prophecies. And then he said of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. What was that commandment? All right. What is it? Here he says, and afterward he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. Some of the disciples that didn't physically see him didn't believe the other disciples that he was literally physically risen from the dead. And he said unto them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. What is the gospel? That Christ died for our sins, according to scriptures, was buried and rose again on the third day, according to scriptures. Now you call it easy believism, but it's not easy for me to believe that somebody rose again from the dead. And if I put my trust in his, that horrible crucifixion, that I get the gift of eternal life. It's not easy for me to believe God loves me that much. You know, and you got to remember back then. They were really trying to convince people that Jesus is the prophesied Messiah. And to the Gentiles, they don't know about the Messiah, but that somebody died for them that didn't know him. That God loved him so much that, that he sent his son and died for him. And he physically, bodily rose from the dead. That's why they had to do all these signs and wonders to prove that God was with them and that it was true. Okay, we take it for granted because we grew up thinking, you know, hearing that how Jesus died for us. And so we thought, oh, that's not enough. It's ridiculous, and you're prideful to think your work of righteousness can add to Jesus' precious blood and sacrifice. How dare you? It's horrifying. Uh, so what is he saying here? All right, so that's the commandment, to preach the gospel, all right, to the apostles. And so it tell, tells us right here, the Lord is not slack consorting his promise. He's, saying don't, he's not uh, uh, going to break his promise. He's coming back. And... But here it is. It, but his law, but uh, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish. So he's saying he's he's not coming right away because he wants people to have more time to believe on him, to be saved. Because he's not willing any should perish, but that all should come to what a change of mind to believe on him. That all should come to repentance. Okay, this is never discussing their uh, behaviors. You better stop that drinking. Stop that, that. None of that. It has nothing to do with that. When the apostles tell the brethren, already saved people, to flee from fornication and sinful things, it is never to get saved or stay saved. Okay? Again, that is your, your behavior, your righteousness. Okay? Your sin, whatever you do in your flesh. That determines reward or loss of it. Chastisement or blessing on this earth. Okay? And even early death, but not eternal life. That's what people can't divide. You can look at 1 Corinthians 3 on that doctrine. All right? So, uh, this is saying that he's not, he hasn't come yet, but it's not because he's not going to keep his promise. It's because he's being patient, long suffering to us, we're being patient with us, not willing anybody perish, but that all come to repentance. You see? That, that nobody face the second death, that all change their mind and believe on Christ. All right? So that's what he's saying. Now, it's interesting to me um, how if I tell somebody that uh, my son's grandfather hated God his whole life, and he never understood, he was in Vietnam, and he was like, I, if there's a God, why do you allow these boys to die like that? He's like, it, there's no God. And he wouldn't believe in Jesus. He wouldn't hear of it. He was hated the whole thing. Okay? But at this during his time of uh, cancer, that a pastor came in and he received Jesus, the, the message of Jesus Christ, that Christ died for sins according to scriptures, was buried and rose again on the third day, and he was saved. Not one person, no matter what their, you know, belief that claims to be Christian, would say that man was lost. They'd all say, praise God, he got saved before he passed on, right? Wouldn't they? So why would they say a person that gets saved at 20 but lives another 40 years isn't saved because they backslid or fell into some sin? Well, if that's the case, you think it's only past sins 
They're not, all my sons were future because he died 2,000 years ago. I wasn't even born yet. So that can't even make sense that only your past, you weren't here. See, the, the time space, man's wisdom. By their wisdom, they were made fools. You know, it's spiritually discerned. It's not after man. It's not going to make sense to you. God does no relative righteousness. Do you understand? It's not, oh, he's pretty good, let him in. No, he's either perfect and can enter heaven or he's not. He's a sinner and he's filthy and he needs to get away from me. Do you understand that? The only way you're perfect is if God imputes his righteousness on your account and presents you spotless and blameless. Do you remember? It's Jesus that presents us to the Father as blameless and spotless. Why? Because we've been washed in his blood. Do you see that now? Okay, so it's crazy to me how somebody could say uh, that because then it'd be just better to wait till you die or get ready to die and say, okay, can forgive me, so I got all of them covered. That's just ridiculous. That's the case. Nobody would get saved uh, scared that they might lose it. You don't lose it because you didn't earn it. And you got it by God's grace because you trusted in something outside of yourself. The, the reason you can't lose it is because it's based on the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. That means you'd have to go back in time and take him off the cross to lose it. You see? Because it's not based on anything you're doing. It's not based on your righteousness. It is absolutely irrelevant. And I don't care about your straw man. So you can get, just believe in Jesus and go rape and kill. You know what? When a person realizes that they're a sinner and they realize how much God loves them, and that really is a free gift. I have yet to see somebody go, yay, I can go murder people now. No, they, the Holy Spirit dwells within them now. Do you understand that? When the Holy Spirit's grieved, they're grieved. That's why people are tormented when they're in, in a habitual sin. They're in torment. Okay? So that's the stupidest straw man. But technically, uh, yeah. But I, I just don't believe that because I think that kind of evil comes from demonic oppression and possession you know it doesn't even make sense there's no precedence for that the, but you look in the old testament david killed his best friend murdered him to cover up the adultery with his wife but he was a man after god's own heart see without faith it's impossible to please god but what happened to david the sword never left his house that guy had a tough life one kid tried to take his throne he was killed one kid raped the other sister and then he was killed by another brother and david had all kinds of enemies and it was just crazy but that's what happened because of it you face natural consequences for the sin all right and if you're a child of god you will be chastised and it says if you're not chastised you're not his son so you'll have consequences you understand that so it's crazy to me because they're basically saying, well, you just, it's better if you just wait till you're about to die and hope you have time to ask for forgiveness. That's absolute nonsense. You get saved, the Holy Spirit lives in you, then he begins a work in you. But he starts at your heart. See, people are looking outside. Well, they're still drinking. So what? That's the thing of the flesh. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, and the body of Christ is not meat and drink, Paul said. It's a spiritual body. So... You know, it's it's really silly when they, they, they don't get it. And they're looking for outward stuff. See, they want the evidence of things not seen. But that's not faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. They're looking to see it. You know? And um, God might just be working on your heart first. He's going to get to the root of some stuff, not the symptoms of the problem, but the problem. And that's a process of spiritual maturity, growing in his grace. Peter says that when a man continues in sin like that, habitual, it, he just forgot that his sins were purged. All right? So we need to abide in his grace, love, and his, the identity we have in him. We're a child of the king. We're royalty. We're a child of the living God. We're holy, righteous, just. We don't wallow in the mud like that. That's not who we are. You got to remind yourself of who you are in Christ and how God sees you. Perfect, just, holy, righteous. He sees his son in your place. You see, it's crazy to me that they would say, yes, he got saved. Okay, so it's better just to hate God your whole life and then, you know, right before death, get saved. Instead of getting saved now and go ahead, you're going to struggle against your flesh. You're going to sin. You might even backslide. You might even have a faith, your face shipwrecked. That's why we're told to renew our minds daily and put on the full armor of God. You see that? It's to protect our faith, to be a good witness, to good testimony. You see how all these false, uh, uh, either false Christians or Christians that were saved that never grew in their faith, it destroys 
people from coming into being a Christian because they see hypocrisy and they're disgusted by the self-righteousness and hypocrisy in it. You know, we don't want to do that. If, if there were more people just resting in the finished work of Christ and sealed, they, they really had the rebirth, this, this would not be as big an issue. And we're supposed to keep each other accountable and, and stuff like that. But th these are issues that have nothing to do with salvation. Eternal life really is a free gift. There is no contradiction. And, and don't be afraid of the word repent. You got to look at the content. What do they say in repent towards? Because you can repent towards or from something. Okay. Repentance towards God and a faith towards Christ. Okay. How do you turn to God? By believing on his son. Remember the Pharisees asked Jesus, what are the works? plural that we do to inherit eternal life and he said this is the work one of god to believe on he whom he sent and this is the will of the father all who see the son believe on and raise him up at the last day it really you got to remember that people just act like uh it's easy for people to believe that uh, a man came god came in the form of a man died and then physically rose again from the dead that it's not easy it's simple it's simple but it's not that easy. And even if it is easy, it's supposed to be easy. Jesus, you know what Jesus compared getting saved to? He basically told the woman in Samaria, if you would have asked, I'd have given you living water, springing up into everlasting life. He didn't say, go, uh, you're, you're, this is your fifth guy you're living with and he's not your husband. You got to leave him and clean up your life and then uh, we'll talk. I'll give it to you then. No, you don't get yourself well before you come to the doctor. Come to Jesus just as you are. We sing that in church. Just as I am, without a plea, except your blood was shed for me. And that's all anybody's going to be able to, to plea in the case in, in their case in front of God. Why should you be let in heaven? Well, I shouldn't. Not on my own merits. But because your son died for me, was buried and rose again on the third day. That's why. I trusted in what he did. Because believing on, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. You're trusting in. It's not just believing some facts, people. It's you're putting your trust, your reliance on this for salvation. You're saying, because he did that, I have absolute knowledge and assurance that I'm going to go to heaven. I have eternal life. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He is eternal life. So when you put your trust in him, you have that life. You have him, and he'll never leave, leave you, forsake you. You know? So it's crazy to me that they say that. Like, like it just makes no sense whatsoever that, well, it's better just to wait till you almost die then. Because if you get saved now and you mess up too bad, pff, that's it. You know, God doesn't have abortions here. He doesn't make you his child by giving you a spiritual rebirth and then abort you. Because that's the only way you could be lost, is if God, like, reversed. You. I don't even know how that would happen. Because you get a literal new reborn, I don't know whatever genetics there are. It's not physical genetics, but spiritual DNA or whatever. You're born again uh, as a new spirit. And the seed of Christ is in you. And he cannot sin. One born of God doth not commit sin, for the seed of Christ is in him. And he cannot sin. He cannot. Not the person in their flesh. The spirit that dwells within. See, that's the problem with men trying to uh, understand scripture without the spirit. They're going to naturally understand. And, and the new ones change it. Will not practice sin. No, no, no. It says cannot sin. Not not possible. Not once. You know, and that's why it's confusion, confusion in the church. You know, it's all about what you're physically doing in the flesh. Okay, you can't do anything in the flesh. The flesh profits nothing in my flesh dwells no good thing all right can't do it without faith it's impossible to please god so that is the real good news and that's what saves lives we had a viewer's brother kill himself over that stupid lordship doctrine scared he couldn't repent of enough sin he kept struggling in his own flesh to try to get over stuff and and it, he felt that god wouldn't re receive him it's disgusting and it's straight out of hell so I wanted to answer this for my beloved viewer that he's not, God's not willing any should perish, but all should come to repentance. He's taking his time coming back because he wants men to have more time. He's being patient with us so that they can have more time to believe on him and change their minds, come to repentance, come to a change of mind where they're believing the gospel. And in this context, uh, he's asking the Hebrew brethren 
you know, to be patient because God is going to come back, but he wants every man to be saved. Okay? All right. Hope I answered it.